My name is Mary Manhas. I am a senior leader within our Canadian commercial banking business at BMO. I've had the pleasure to work at BMO for over 20 years within multiple lines of business in sales leadership and strategy roles, including our treasury and payments business here in Canada, which I am most passionate about. I am pleased to join you today with our panel for a discussion on a topic I believe is on all our minds, and that is the current economic environment. Today, we'll talk about its impacts and how we protect our digital ecosystem against cybersecurity risks, something that we are all vulnerable to. We'll provide insights on how you can remain vigilant against fraud, how we protect our payment systems, and we'll also take a few minutes to showcase a demonstration in real time of a live hack, which I find fascinating no matter how many times I've seen it. We hope to provide a lively discussion on BMO's perspectives and our strategies for resiliency in these complex times. As I said earlier, we will be leaving a few minutes at the end of our discussion for Q&A. So please use the chat box on the right as questions come to mind for our panelists. And we'll try to get to as few, a few of them uh, at the end of our session. Joining me today are two experts, and I will keep these introductions brief while also ensuring to do their experience uh, justice. Larry Zelvin, Head Financial Crimes Unit here at BMO Financial Group. Larry is responsible globally for cybersecurity, fraud, physical security, and crisis management. Prior to joining BMO, Larry was a Managing Director and the Global Head of Cybersecurity at Citigroup, and also held several roles in the US government, including with Homeland Security, the White House, and the Pentagon. Larry also served as a US Naval officer and aviator for 26 years. Next, I would like to introduce Michael Gregory, Deputy Chief Economist and Head of US Economics with BMO Capital Markets. Michael manages the team responsible for forecasting and analyzing the North American economy and financial markets. Michael began his career in economics with the Royal Bank of Canada working in their foreign exchange and money research group. Before moving into his current role in BMO Capital Markets, Michael headed up our financial analysis uh, team as well. Now, I've had the privilege of uh, hearing both Larry and Michael speak a number of times, and I know I will personally benefit from what I hope you will find an engaging discussion today. So Larry and Michael, thank you both for being here. And let's start this off with a question for you, Michael. On the topic of the economy, of course, what we're hearing most about is inflation and the rising interest rate environment. Could you provide your perspective on the latest insights and impacts that we should all be prepared for, especially relative to the financial payment space that most of us are in? Sure thing. Uh, th thanks, uh, Mary. And uh, either good morning or good afternoon to everyone, depending where you are. Uh, in the country. Yes, inflation at the top uh, of everyone's conversation these days. And not surprisingly, uh, we, we recently saw the headline inflation rate in Canada was a 6.7%. Uh, we haven't seen a kind of an inflation rate like that since uh, one blip we had in January of 1991 when the GST was introduced. But apart from that one month blip, you got to go all the way back to uh, uh, 1983, almost 40 years ago before you see an inflation rate as high as we have now. And, uh, you know, when we think about these high inflation rates, and by the way, we're seeing, you know, uh, extreme levels in core inflation and other sort of sub indices in that as well. And, and, and you know, we think about what's been happening on the inflation front. There's two things that have been going on. Obviously, we've had constrained supply, disrupted global supply chains, and that's put a lot of upward pressure on prices. That was largely the result of the pandemic. But it wasn't only about the supply side. As it's turned out, you know, the demand side of the economy was also very strong as well, stimulated by a, uh, uh, all, all the government stimulus that we had uh, oh, oh, you know, uh, during, during the pandemic, although a lot of that has, has pulled back, you know, it's still there's a legacy effect of that stimulus. And if anything, uh, some of these supply bottlenecks would have been uh, dealt with a long time ago if demand wasn't as strong as it was. And, and in some cases, you know, we think that, in fact, these constrained supply issues are more a symptom 
a strong demand, not necessarily the opposite way. Unfortunately, uh, you know, these two things, uh, uh, constrained supply, a strong demand has resulted in these inflationary pressures. And, and unfortunately, over the past few months, uh, we, we've seen these pressures kind of uh, ignite even further uh, with the war in Ukraine, sanctions on Russia, further lockdowns in China. This is worsening the uh, global supply disruptions, which are inherently inflationary. Uh, and, it, and more importantly, it's added to the inflation fires in the economy, particularly on two areas of uh, food and energy. Uh, Russia, Ukraine, Belarus are major producers of energy, metals and food. And that is it sort of caused our own prices here at home to go up. We're almost 8 uh, percent year over year increase in food prices. We haven't seen that kind of uh, increase in food prices since uh, 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 we had a global food crisis 2007-2008. And of course, we're almost uh, well above 27% year on year in energy prices. And, and apart from a blip we had last year, we haven't seen those kind of figures since the early 1980s. And if anything, those two pressures are going to get worse because it does seem that the conflict in Eastern Europe is continuing uh, to, to worsen. And if that's not the only thing we have to worry about, there's basically three kind of inflation risks that, that are on the horizon here. And the first of those is what's fueling the demand side. You know, we happen to think that uh, since, the, since the onset of the pandemic, Canadian households have amassed a lot of additional savings uh, uh, over this period. And, and it, it comes in, you know, uh, roughly, you know, at around just under 10 percent of GDP in terms of the amount of excess savings that they've accumulated. And we're not quite sure exactly uh, how much of this savings is left over. Obviously, some of it has been deployed, no doubt, in the housing sector over the last little while. But when you look at the amount of deposits that are sitting in the banking system, uh, and that is liquidity that's readily available, not only for consumers, but businesses, that too weighs in at a very large level, again, uh, almost around 10% of GDP. So it does seem there's a lot of liquidity out there to help fuel spending, even in the face of higher prices. And, and that is something the Bank of Canada is worried about. The second thing, uh, in terms of the inflation, I, look, I, I want to comment on, is wage inflation. Now, unlike, say, the United States, where we've seen a pretty hefty wage increases, Canada has been rather uh, moderate. We're roughly running around three and a half percent year on year. It's, it's above where it has been, you know, uh, it's from a trend basis, but nowhere near the kind of levels, as I mentioned, we've seen south of the border. That said, we are expecting wage inflation to pick up further. Why? Well, we have an unemployment rate of 5.3%. We haven't had an unemployment rate that low since the start of the current labor force survey, which began in 1976. And we still have over 800,000 job openings across this country. And there's only 1.1 million people unemployed. So, so the labor markets are tight and they're going to get tighter and that's going to put upward pressure on inflation. And the third factor that is worrying uh, for the Bank of Canada and for us inflation watchers is home prices. You know, the latest reading you had were up over 27% year on year across the country. It's starting to cool off a little bit, but not fast enough to prevent it from leaking in to the various measures of CPI inflation. So you put all these things together and the Bank of Canada, quite frankly, has had enough. We saw them raise interest rates 25 basis points in March, 50 basis points in May. Uh, uh, and uh, 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 going to be in May. And, and, uh, and we do think that uh, we are going to, sorry, it's April, I did that. And we do think that they're going to continue to raise interest rates. They're toying with the idea of another 50 in June. Uh, in fact, we think they'll f follow through with that. In fact, we're looking for another 50 basis points increase in July. And, 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 and where we think they'll take a uh, stop and take a bit of a breather is when we get after that last move in July, we're at 2% in terms of the Bank of Canada's policy rate. And that happens to be the bottom of the 2 to 3% neutral range. And that's important because the Bank of Canada wants to get to this point of being neutral. That's the point where they're not pressing the accelerator in terms of rates too low, but neither pressing the brakes where, where rates are get high. And then we do too high. And we do think that after that point, they'll move a little more cautiously, maybe once every quarter, to get rates up to about 275, which is near the top of that range. So we don't think they're going to have to push rates above 3%. We do think that should do the trick in, in, in starting to cool inflation. Now, all the worry is this is going to hurt the, the, the economy. It's going to dampen growth. There's no doubt about it. But we have a lot of momentum going into that. 
We still think we'll average about three and a half percent growth for this year, three percent next year, which, by the way, on average is still above our speed limit, which is roughly around two and a quarter, two and a half percent, which means we do think the unemployment rate is going to continue to drift lower, even below a five percent before starting to drift up again. And the bottom line, what does this mean for inflation? We think inflation will uh, start to cool off. Uh, more so on the headline, we do think the core inflation will drift up a little bit higher yet. But by the time we get to the end of next year, when all of these rate hikes are in and uh, slower growth is in, unemployment rate starting to rise a little bit, we'll think we'll be just uh, under 3% or around 3% in terms of inflation. That's still a bit too high, but at least it's in within that 1% to 3% range that the Bank of Canada is prepared to tolerate. And we do think it'll slide further in 2024. But if it doesn't slow fast enough, we all know what's going to happen. The Bank of Canada is going to be even more aggressive on the interest rate side. And, and the history tells us when the Bank of Canada starts gaining aggressive, when they start pushing rates well above 3%, the net result is a very weak economy, if not a recession. And uh, hopefully we don't have to uh, uh, result in, in that kind of a scenario. But that is clearly where the net risk lies. Thank you for that, Michael. I, I know a big and complex uh, topic that requires more time than we have here, but you've certainly given us some good insights on the things that we're hearing about the most, and I and I hope we'll uh, garner some questions in the question box as well. Larry, moving over to you. Uh, we know the current economic challenges will be felt for some time, and we're seeing that now as we start to come out of the pandemic. And of course, what's also top of mind is the war uh, in Eastern Europe, as Michael mentioned, and the global impacts as a result. So what do you see as new or increased security risks uh, that this has posed? Look, when you look at Russia, Ukraine, um, I think, look, the world is in a very dangerous situation, probably one of the greatest dangers we've had since the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, but this is really a conflict that is having not only a military uh, level of, of engagement, but also more importantly, globally economic sanctions are being used to Russia to try and change their behavior, to convince them that the war is not worth fighting and to withdraw. That doesn't seem to be working. When you look at the cost of this war, look, when you deploy uh, military forces, when you deploy ships and artillery and tanks, those costs are incredibly high, especially if they expend fuel and ammunition and all these, all, all those expenses they need to be paid for. Then you have the normal expenses government has to cover. But they've had the loss of revenue, not only because of sanctions, but because of also Russia recently cut off, as Michael mentioned, uh, energy to Poland and Volcker area, and there may be more coming. So there's also that loss of tax revenue from international business that have, were in, in uh, Russia. Uh, so they're going to have to find a way to make money. And they may do it the old fashioned way, and that is to steal it. Um, when you look at North Korea you know, and the sanctions impact and how they reacted, the North Koreans uh, looked at uh, payment fraud, uh, specifically using the SWIFT messaging system. Uh, one of the largest frauds ever attempted was a $1 billion fraud with the Bank of Bangladesh. There were several other frauds throughout Asia and also Central America before the North Koreans said, you know what, this is a little bit too public. This is a little bit too much attention than we really wanted. And then they started going after cryptocurrency. Uh, they just did a multi hundred million dollar cryptocurrency theft against uh, one of the gaming crypto sites. But there are so many cases of North Korea impacting the crypto market. And then they were actually doing ATM cash outs, working with criminal gangs around the world within two days, making, again, tens of not uh, probably upwards of tens of millions of dollars just by going after ATMs. I don't think you're going to see the Russians going after crypto. I don't think you see them going after ATM. But look. It, as Russia was cut off of the SWIFT network, they may get to the point of, well, if we can't use it, neither can you. That would create great disruption, or they could use, like the North Korea, they could potentially have fraud, mes fraud messaging uh, that tries to get its bankers to move money to places they shouldn't. I think you could also look for the Russians to do some market manipulation, create news that will either drive stocks up or stocks down. Uh, this would be, again, fraudulent uh, in nature, but again, could give them some legitimacy of money but doing it through illegitimate means. Identity theft, particularly as you have that tit for tat when they're, as we're going after oligarchs, they could potentially go after high visibility folks that have been very vocal against the Russian government as they're calling them Russophobes uh, and protect, perhaps going after their money, not only within their businesses, but potentially personally. Last outright theft, potentially going in electronically using cyber means 
to steal money out of people's accounts and then wiring them to illegitimate accounts. So now that I potentially scared you, what do we do about it and how do we do better? I think in, in speaking to this audience, the best defense are informed bankers. As a cybersecurity professional, I will tell you that we have a number of great defenses and great monitoring means that we use. But in the case of Bangladesh, when that fraud occurred, there was somebody at the New York Fed who saw a message and said, you know what, this word is misspelled. This doesn't look right. There was a sanction uh, hit that really wasn't actually part of the sanction regime, but it did draw more attention. That was the lead they needed as security professionals to stop that $1 billion from being lost. And ultimately, uh, only about $100 million of the $1 billion was actually lost and, and wandered uh, all, all over Asia. So my reach out to all of you uh, as non-security people, as I think many of you are, is, is, look, it's a phrase we used to use when I was in Homeland Security. It sounds a little goofy. It seems a little immature, but it works. And that is, if you see something, say something. Don't assume something is right. Do challenge it, do do your due diligence. And if it really isn't, please report it to your security professionals because in many cases, that which allows us to understand an event and actually counter it can come from an individual. And very often it's the individuals who do the banking and the business every single day. Thanks, Larry. And yes, you probably have scared us all, even those that are, are in the industry and hear about this all the time. Keeping with that same theme, just sort of a, a follow-up question. Outside of the increased threats we're now experiencing with the unrest in, uh, with Russia and Ukraine, which you've just talked about, what are a few typical cybersecurity risks and prevention tools we should always employ day-to-day -day outside of what's happening uh, globally in world events? Look, there's still obviously, there, there's not only Russia and Ukraine, but you still have challenges with North Korea and Iran. Um, they're still very much focused on getting around sanctions and they're coming up with different means to raise money. And again, a lot of it is criminality. When you look at criminals, you've got that, as you said, that nation state uh, criminal a a nexus, but in some cases, just the criminal groups out there, again, trying to make money uh, on themselves. One of the key ways in cyber they're doing it is through ransomware. Uh, ransomware continues to go on, although you're not seeing these high profile ransom events like you saw at Colonial Pipeline in the United States, where there was a shutdown of a uh, fuel uh, through most of the eastern side of the Mississippi. Criminals are learning that's not really a good way to do business, right? They don't want to caught, be caught. They don't want a lot of attention. So they're going after those small and medium-sized businesses who may not have the protections and may want to just pay just due to the uh, fear of reputational damage. We're seeing an extraordinary amount of business email compromises, and they're becoming incredibly sophisticated. Some of the more concerning business email compromises we're seeing uh, from our customers uh, is a uh, customer's personal email account or phone has been compromised. They will report to, the, to their financial institution that their password uh, needs to be changed or it was lost. So you call in and they say, hey, well, can you verify that with your phone or with your email? And you say, absolutely, but that bad actor actually has access to your phone or email. So it looks like the customer, they get the password access and now they're off and running and they can move money and wire it wherever they need. There's also this thing called deep fakes where they can mimic people's phones and they can mimic their faces. Um, you really do need to question and make sure that the person you're speaking to as a banker is really that person. And I think, unfortunately, too often, a lot of our bankers are really trying to make sure their customers are well served and pleased in other, where they really should be going, hey, is this really my customer or is this a fraudster? So and I will tell you, especially uh, in the customers that we deal with in the aftermath of a fraud, really don't mind that effective challenge. They don't mind going, hey, could I validate you are who you are? Because we're seeing millions and tens of millions of dollars of losses just by identity theft alone. You have a lot of hackers that, oh, I'm sorry, we also talk about account takeovers, right? So a lot of these things, simple passwords um, that people will go in uh, and get access to uh, your bank account or your uh, personal uh, checking or savings or credit cards, uh, if you use debit cards, uh, just because you're using easy passwords. Um, hackers are also out there. So you have the nation states, you have the criminals, but you also have hackers, people who are involved in causes, environmental causes, social causes, whatever it may be. Uh, and in many cases, they may be hacking into you to uh, do reputational damage or to put forth their messages to people who they want to see them. Uh, I will tell you, there are multiple cases of folks who are able to take over video chats just like this, only to make a message. And this is not a political statement, but we'll talk about global warming or maybe talking about high taxations or COVID restrictions. 
Um, so their ability to go in and hack is another concern. One of the biggest concerns and one of the most difficult things for us to do as cybersecurity professionals is countering insiders, people we need to trust within our businesses, within our organizations who go rogue. Uh, they're upset because of perhaps they didn't get the bonus they wanted. Perhaps they have a boss who they don't like. Perhaps that they are uh, have a cause that they don't believe the company is taking seriously. These folks are the most difficult to deal with. And then finally, and we're not seeing a whole lot of this anymore, but it's still out there, terrorists. Terrorist organizations are still alive and well, and we need to be aware that they are also using cyber means. So again, now that I've scared you, now what do we do? One of the most common uh, recommendations for dealing with these and also the nation state threats I talked about with Russia is, is you have to patch your vulnerabilities. Uh, I want you to envision a tent. I want you to envision you're out a camping and whether you camp or not, hopefully the imagery is there. And imagine there are holes in that tent and it starts raining or it gets incredibly cold or in the case of Canada, it starts snowing. You're gonna wanna patch those uh, holes so you can stay comfortable and secure. You do need to do those also with your information technology systems. We in security and technology are in conflict many times with our financial uh, colleagues by they're going, oh my gosh, you guys patching, it's making my computer take so long to reboot, you're breaking stuff. But you do realize that those disruptions are incredibly necessary. Otherwise we may have bad actors going through that tent and doing more than just raining on you or snowing on you. Two-factor authentication is important as well. It may be more difficult for you to go, oh my gosh, how many times do I have to log into my account to make it work? But do know as we make these two-factor authentications, it makes it harder for the adversary. Many of these bad actors, they're like water. They'll go to the lowest path of resistance. So if we can create friction, they'll move on to somebody else who they can make us just as much money for with a lot less effort. Lastly, training and education. We really need to make people aware of these threats to understand they have a duty and obligation. They are part of the security team, whether they like it or not. And to again, report these incidents to us so we can investigate them properly and hopefully thwart uh, these attacks from recurring or even making them worse. Over to you, Mary. Thanks, Larry. I have the visual of the snowy tent in my head now, and I hope that's not something we have to think about uh, for the rest of the season. But I know we're just skimming the surface here and you have so many more uh, tales you could share. But again, I think you've given us a good foundational understanding of the current uh, cybersecurity landscape. And so we're going to change things up a little bit here. And as I said earlier, share a visual that will bring some of this dialogue that we've been having um, to life. And as I said, it fascinates me every time. So I'd like to introduce to you now, John Galuzzo. John is director of Financial Crimes Unit, uh, also here at BMO Financial Group. He has responsibilities in our Fusion Center with expertise in cybersecurity including incident response and uh, threat mitigation. So um, as I said, John will actually be sharing a live demonstration. And so with that, John, over to you. So thank you, Mary. Thank you uh, for having me and honored to be here again with Larry. Uh, Larry and I have been doing a similar type presentation showing uh, some of the scary stuff about hacking and uh, since I guess 2014. And uh, we keep modifying and changing it, but I'd like to show you more. So I think my colleague is gonna share and bring it up on screen. Uh, and then what we'll do is we'll show you what it looks like for it. So um, just give me the nod when you folks could see it on screen. There we go. So uh, what we're gonna do for you here is we're gonna kind of give you that perspective from both uh, uh, a victim, what it looks like when you're hacked, but we're also gonna give you the perspective from the threat actor and what a threat actor sees when he's in the process of hacking. Very quickly to get into that, to show you where the hack before we get there, we're gonna kind of define a little bit of a scenario for you. So in our case, our threat actor are, uh, is looking for a target. We're gonna suggest that maybe it's a, a, a chief financial officer, maybe a treasurer works for a company, somebody that the, you know deals with money. And that's really what our focus is gonna be using all open source, perhaps LinkedIn, perhaps search engines. We're gonna come up with a name and we're gonna find a LinkedIn account for our victim here. And we're gonna call that person Arthur Leaf. From that name, Arthur Leaf, we then do more open searches. And maybe we find things like Instagram accounts that are not locked down or Facebook accounts that are open, where as a threat actor, I could get more information to really target our, our victim. In this particular case, we're gonna suggest that we come across with the victim's daughter. Her name happens to be Aretha Leaf. And in her open Instagram account that she doesn't have locked down, we're able to get images and pictures and things that she likes. 
so we could craft a very targeted uh, phishing text message over to our victim, enticing them to click. So we're gonna switch our screens to our virtual platform. And uh, in a moment, what you'll see, left-hand side, the light blue background is gonna be our victim's cell phone. And on the right-hand side, the black background is gonna be our threat actor console, and we're gonna show you how it works. So in our scenario, the top message you see on the left-hand side says Aretha Leaf. It's a message that the victim at least recognizes being from the doc, uh, from his daughter. We're gonna click on that message or the victim will click at least. And we're gonna see a couple of things. It's gonna be a targeted message in this case. It might be a, a video uh, similar to what the, some high net worth individuals that were attacked with. And the message might be something simple. Hey dad, here's where I wanna go on vacation. Uh, knowing that she likes to travel according to Instagram, very targeted okay to click on it, or at least the, the victim feels, hey, we know this one, we're gonna click. Once that click happens, so now the cell phone is beginning to be compromised. On the right-hand side, the threat actor console starts to wake up and it starts pulling in information. Uh, unfortunately, our victim has no sense that they're being compromised at all. So once things come over, we're gonna do a couple of things. We're gonna maybe go to location, for example, right? So our threat actor pulls in, uh, uh, GPS, if you think about your smartphones and tablets, they use GPS. Here it will zoom exactly where that phone is located. We're gonna suggest here that this happens to be our victim's home. Perhaps he's uh, based in California, he's working from the office here. So we have the location of where the device is. We're now gonna go back out of that. And from that, we're gonna go into other things, maybe chat messages. Uh, so we're gonna click on chats. And now what we'll see here is as a threat actor, I have a copy of every text message that our victim has on their phone. So I could go if I wanted to, I could go into the chats, I could read the messages. I certainly have all the contact names and I could certainly expand this campaign and, and reach out with more malicious malware to all those individuals. So aside from chats, I'm gonna go back out one more page and I'm gonna click on to uh, audio. If you think about your Sa uh, excuse me, your cell phones, your cell phones are microphones and they're designed to, uh, you know, record your voice. Here now, our threat actor, this is what it looks like to them. Not only can I stream and hear what you're saying on your phone, but I could also do recordings of that and send it back to uh, my threat actor console here, if you will. And this is what it looks like for that. So I have location, I have chats, I have uh, audio. Now I'm gonna go back into that screen. And one more thing under uh, miscellaneous, uh, we're gonna show you the camera. If you think about your cell, uh, cell phones, they have front cameras, back cameras, four cameras. Here, our threat actor is gonna activate that camera and we're gonna click one more time for that button. We're gonna see if we could turn it on. Now, our victim's not gonna know this. Our victim is not gonna hear a sound, is not gonna hear any indication that his camera has just been activated, but this is what it looks like. And keep in mind, not only can I take photos, I could also stream video as well of our victim. So we have chats, we have uh, pictures, we have everything. We're gonna go back now, uh, one more click, and we're gonna show the audience what it looks like for, um, you know, uh, under the applications, what might be located under that uh, phone itself. Think about all the apps that you're using, uh, health apps. Think about uh, apps that remotely start your automobile, a wealth of information uh, uh, that they'll have there. So we're gonna click one more time out of this screen and I'm gonna guide you to one more spot. So go one more back there. Uh, my colleague here is driving for us here. We're gonna go into, um, let's, let's go back to miscellaneous, my bad. We're gonna demonstrate under uh, internal storage and show you some things that you may wanna be aware that now our threat actor has since that phone has been compromised. I will get things like storage locations. I'll get things of like where those folders are, where other items are stored. I'll get things like what the version operating system that you're using. So now I know specifically what to target you with to steal more information. Maybe you have a folder called application data. And if you think about your mobile devices, you have all these apps on them. And on those devices, you'll have temporary files, application data that uses uh, you know, certain key things to get there. Things like, you know, I see that there's a baby monitoring system, for example. So I'm gonna click on that one and I'm gonna show you specifically code. Code that, by the way, was available on the dark web marketplace that will allow a threat actor to activate a baby monitor camera. And we're gonna actually demonstrate that. So we're gonna click back out of here Clearly we're all over the phone. Clearly we have access to a variety of things. Your, you know, your downloads folder, your trash items, uh, you know, your internet browsing history. It's now all becomes uh, uh, compromised in this campaign. So we're gonna show you some scary hops now. We're gonna go into uh, something called the network probe. So on that network probe, what you're gonna see and what the bad guy will see is 
you have one compromised device, we're going to suggest that our victims may be working from home today. That one compromised device is now mapped to everything that happens to be on his home network. So here we see a variety of different things. Our probe will now reveal uh, devices on the network. So with one click, we're now going to see, uh, you know, maybe some other common things you might be running right now in your home. You might have like a smart home, like maybe an Amazon Alexa. You may have printers. You may have security cameras. Well, what we're going to show you now is all uh, images from compromised uh, devices. And this we want to show you is what it looks like. So with one click, we're going to go into what is an Amazon Alexa, for example, grab on you. It grabs things like your voice. It grabs things like what you searched on for the internet. Uh, you know, your music playlist, for example. So a wealth of information I get now just by this one compromised device. Next, we move on to uh, security cameras. So here, what we have shown you on the image is a security camera from, example, a front doorbell. So if you think about your front doorbell cameras, uh, very convenient. Yeah, you know, certainly you'll know what time your children might come home from school. You may know, uh, for example, what time a package is delivered. But for a threat actor now, now I have access to the front door. I might see things like whose car is in the driveway, what time you leave for work, what time you come home. But I promise you the bad guy is not going to stop at the front door. So here our actor is going to go one more time. We're going to go right into that baby monitor that we talked about earlier. So here, uh, this was a, a compromise from a ring security uh, security system a few years back, quite honestly. But this image does represent what the threat actor did. They turn that camera on into the uh, the child's room. Not only that, but they actually use the intercom system to communicate back and forth with the child. So we go from front door, we go right into the home. Other smart devices, think about your smart television. So with one click, our threat actor now activates the camera on that smart television. And maybe this is something you might have in your living room or a family room. And now I have access to that. So clearly we hopped all over the home here. Uh, think about all those other devices that you have uh, connected. Uh, so the last hop, I think we're gonna back out of this screen. And before I hand it back to Larry, one more thing to consider is uh, what's popular these days, unfortunately, is ransomware, and you heard that term. So our threat actor uh, could simply use the code that he sent over with that malware to now lock out that device. Um, so for a threat actor, it looks like this. He could enter in a particular amount, and then when he's ready, he clicks the button called Activate Ransomware. And unfortunately for our victim, our victim will see something that may be holding all his data for a hostage. And unfortunately, in some cases, you may pay your Bitcoin ransom, but uh, chances are you're not going to recover that data. Um, so I think maybe at this point, uh, I'll hand over for Larry if you want us uh, to do more or less, but over to you, sir. Thanks, John. Just one thing for everybody. And again, <clears throat> we apologize for scaring the living heck out of you. I've seen some of the comments, um, but we also hope we've informed you. But I have one public safety announcement that is absolutely critical. I need you to listen to me carefully. Do not try this at home. It is illegal at the federal, state, provincial, territorial, and also municipal levels. We are allowed to do this because we are off network and it's under consent. Uh, so please don't use this against your spouse, your children, although I think they should let you use it against your children, your coworkers, or anybody else, okay? If you do this, uh, it is illegal. If somebody, if you do not heed my advice and they go, where did you see this? Please tell them you started a demo at Scotiabank. All right, Mary, over to you. Thanks for that, John and Larry. And yes, terrifying. And I'm seeing the comments as well. And considering we all live on our phones, uh, definitely gives us a lot to think about. And I know we've got a couple of questions uh, regarding the demo, so we'll get to those in uh, in just a minute. So. I mean, we've heard a number of tips and best practices and maybe some fear tactics as well, but overall, uh, you know, different ways that we can protect ourselves, some that may feel obvious and others may be less so. When it comes specifically to uh, fraud solutions uh, for payments, what I emphasize is the importance of having these conversations on an ongoing basis. Uh, the fraud landscape is ever changing, um, and as we just heard, global events can lead, um, or sorry, can introduce us to new threats. And so, for us at BMO, talking about fraud solutions and risk management uh, with our clients is part of most, if not all, conversations. So whether that means we're proactively talking about a specific fraud solution to clients, uh, you know, in regards to the way that they manage their payments or inviting uh, our clients to listen in or read on thought leadership or you know, hearing uh, Larry and uh, Michael and John talk today, or sometimes even in the unfortunate circumstance of reacting to a fraud event and providing um, education much like today as well. 
we invite these conversations with our payments professionals um, on an ongoing basis so that they are alive and, and always happening. And that's really uh, my hope as an outcome of today's dialogue as well. We've talked about a number of things that are thought provoking, a little scary, but likely that raise more questions than we initially uh, had coming into this session. And so uh, with that, I am going to just look for a couple of questions uh, before we wrap up here. So uh, Larry or John, how does malware get installed by simply watching a video? Is the implication that because this individual trusted his daughter, he actually installed something? Or are you implying that watching a video can plant malware on our devices? Sure, I'll start and then John, I'm, I'm happy to have you elaborate. And my, my colleagues at Scotia, I was just poking fun, so please uh, know that uh, it, it, it comes from a, uh, a competitive, but also a very collegial way. So I, ho I, I hope, uh, I hope you see it, you see it that way because it, it is absolutely how I intended it. So, look, I think what John was demonstrating is is that the he as the hacker was betraying trust. Uh, they did their work, they did their research, they knew who their victim was from LinkedIn. They looked and found their children, uh, which is a very common way to engender trust. Uh, I will tell you, I've worked in security all my life. Uh, a few years back, I had an email from my daughter. Uh, so I said, hmm, what's that? I opened the uh, email and then I went, oh my gosh. Uh, it was not an email she would normally send. It did not have people who she normally, she would never email everybody in her address book. There was a link at the bottom that she was asking me to click on. I knew it wasn't her. I alerted her, so on and so forth. I think the malware aspect, if you click on a link or if you click on something that activates uh, a video or anything of that nature, that is a common method that allows you to download malware onto your device, uh, albeit your personal computer, your, your uh, laptop, your iPad. So that simple ability of clicking on a link, opening uh, a, a movie or a streaming device, uh, that simple act where you think you're just hearing music, you're just watching a video, or you're just going to somewhere that your your trusted partner has told you to go, that uh, is actually a, a false uh, flag uh, and is actually a means for the bad actor to put malware on your computer. John, anything you want to follow up on? Uh, nothing to add, sir, other than just like you said, right? The video was not even the was not even the the purpose, right? The video was just to distract. It was actually the malware behind the scene that's running. So the threat actor puts a video so your mind is uh, drifted off as it's opening up the door and installing ransomware and so forth. So, yes. Thank you both. I know this is a, a hot topic. So uh, another question here. We have implemented a regime of regular education and fish testing for our cybersecurity risk. Do you have any other suggested activities? I know, Larry, you shared some uh, earlier, but anything else to add there? Yeah, a little bit of a, a, a shameless plug, but I do think it's worth your time. If you go to BMO.com, scroll to the bottom, go to the security link. And this is not me trying to put malware on your computer. This is me actually trying to help you. But if you click on that security link, um, we have offered a number of suggestions, not only in cybersecurity, but also in fraud and also in physical security. Now, um, we do keep that up to date with some of the latest tactics, techniques, or procedures of what we call tradecraft you need to keep yourself uh, routinely educated uh, about these threats so you can counteract them. Uh, so when you look at the training and education, it's not a once and done, you've got to continue to keep informed. The other aspect I would say is, is that when you look at the victims of cyber crime, there are two groups in particular that really stand out. And the first is elderly and the second are children or adolescents. They typically are the most vulnerable. So I would say not only you as a professional, but if you have uh, old elderly moms or dads or grandparents, if you have young folks, and look, young folks could be two or three. It's amazing. Some kids are able to uh, manipulate a my iPad before they can actually have a real conversation. Uh, but I think, you know, when you get to teenage children in particular, you have to have conversations with them about these threats and what to do and how to alert them. One of the biggest problems we see with folks who are older is what we call the, the the shaming aspect, right? They feel really horrible that they were brought into this romance scheme and gave their money away. They feel horrible that they were duped by a business email compromise. Look, they are victims. They are they are people who should be treated with empathy. They should not be judged and convicted because somebody who went after them was able to manipulate them. So talk about the shaming aspects. And the same thing goes with your kids. Gosh, I shouldn't have been on that site. 
But you know what? It's better to tell mom and dad or their caregiver that, hey, this happened, than to find out that your 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 child uh, may be having a um, uh, an inappropriate conversation with somebody you really don't want them to be chatting with. Thanks, Larry. I feel like that uh, that shaming piece is is relevant, uh, especially when people don't want to to admit that this happened to them. Yeah, uh, and, and, and Mary, for what it's worth, I admit. I have actually opened links, I've clicked on links, and I do this for a living. I have failed phishing tests. So folks, if I can do it, believe me, you can do it as well. And I, I, I own it and, and hopefully get better because of it. Yes, and I'm actually thinking about conversations I've had with my own mother as she learned how to use a cell phone many years ago and uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know what that looked like as well. Um, I think we've got time for just one last question here. And so I will open this up to all of you. It was mentioned that misinformation driven market manipulation is a likely channel for state actors to bypass sanctions. How can the financial industry overall act to help combat misinformation um, or disinformation for the public at large? Uh, Michael, you want to start or would you like me to as you get your thoughts together? Well, no, no, I'm ha happy to do that. Uh, I mean, obviously, to, to counter misinformation is you have to give real information, uh, true facts, as someone once said. And I, I, and I think like a forum like this, where we're talking about, you know, what, what's going on in the economy, what, what, you know, uh, what's going on, uh, the events unfolding uh, in Eastern Europe. I think you, you have to talk openly about these things. There's a lot of rumors that get circulated very, very quickly through all the various chats that actually, you know, lead to people buying and selling stocks and, and things like that. And and when asked to, it's important that we we we, we be a voice of authority uh, in these things and 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 you know call call misinformation for what it is. It's uh, often just lies attempting to manipulate the markets or economies or or whatever the case may be. So I think it's very much about education and 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 giving that information and and sending it out to people so that they know actually what's going on. Yeah, I, I would add, look, the, the you know, one of the, the advice I gave is, you know, if you see something, say something. The other advice I give is to slow down, <laughs> slow down. I mean, a lot of these manipulations happen because people are distracted because they're going too quickly, that they're not giving the time to kind of assess and think it through. But uh, and I wish him no ill, but imagine what would happen if there was a report that Jamie Dimon had some sort of accident and was either critically ill or was actually, or actually passed. Uh, I would imagine that would have a major impact on JP Morgan's stock, but I'll leave that to Michael. Imagine if there was a report of a major pipeline disruption somewhere in the world, and then the you know energy futures traders are looking at it and go, oh my gosh, you know, and, and all of a sudden money's moving based on you know, how, how the markets are gonna react and how the prices are gonna change and only to find out that you know, there really was no pipeline disruption. So we, we've gotta be careful, we've gotta slow down uh, and, and do know that um, you know, there is manipulation out there uh, and that uh, you need to get fact from fiction. Uh, otherwise you can have a, a heck of a lot of regret because as we all well know, money can be made, lost as quickly as it is made. Thank you both. Uh, as I said, thought provoking and uh, you've all likely uh, raised more questions than we had uh, at the outset, but I think a very important conversation to have. So we are at time now. And so thank you all for being here. And thank you, Larry, Michael uh, and John for sharing your valuable expertise on topics that are both uh, important and uh, very relevant in today's environment. So thanks everybody. Thank you all. Thank you, Mary.